what is trending, guys? Well, according to Google, something about the Hogwarts video game, inflation, and then I think I read about Alec Baldwin having some kind of issue with corrosion, maybe? Sounds like the guy just needs some WD-40. Oh, yeah, and 5.7 by 28 is hot. And I love to see it. I love to see 5.7 on the come up, and boy, is it ever. FN's cartridge is over 30 years old right now, but looking better than ever. A little bit like the Peta Jensen of the gun cartridge community. There was only one handgun firing 5.7 three years ago, but now big names like Keltec, Ruger, Palmetto State Armory, and now, of course, Smith & Wesson joining the 5.7 Fiesta. Before we get to the review, why even 5.7? I feel like I've made three or four videos already answering this question. I'm sorely tempted to just make a 5.7 video playlist. Okay, I just did it up there. Now you can find out more about what makes 5.7 so great using the videos in that playlist on screen. I probably pointed at the wrong corner. But to briefly summarize, you're talking about a round that was designed to meet a NATO solicitation. NATO wanted a round to replace 9mm. They wanted this new round to be lower recoiling, higher range, greater capacity, just as effective as 9mm. Also had to be able to defeat body armor at distance as well. On almost all counts, the 5.7 does it. The one Asterix is the terminal performance department. Mathematically, 9mm generates much more energy than 5.7, but terminal ballistics experts are kind of divided on whether or not the sheer velocity of the 5.7 round and the devastating effects that it can have on soft tissue actually match 9mm's performance. All right, I'm going to drop it for now. But if you want to do more research about 5.7 performance, I encourage you to do that. On the other hand, if you're like me and you're wondering if 5.7 is actually topping from the bottom these days, maybe you should look at the Smith & Wesson M&P 5.7. We're doing that in this video, and we're comparing it to the PSA Rock, the Ruger 5.7, and the FN 5.7 pistol. Missing my optic on it right now. To start... The M&P 5.7 is, at least in aesthetics and build quality, similar to the rest of the Smith & Wesson M&P series of pistols. That's a good thing, because the M&P series has been around for almost 20 years now. It's a tested, proven platform. Does that necessarily mean that the M&P 5.7 is going to be as solid as an old-fashioned M&P 9? Maybe, maybe not. But at a minimum, it's a good starting point. There are only two pistols on this list that have a .gov pedigree. The FN 5.7, this is a pistol that's been adopted by a shitload of government end users. And now you've got the M&P, which by itself is brand new, but at least it has roots with a successful and long-running family of pistols. But the M&P 5.7 is different than the rest of the M&P family in a number of ways. The standard M&Ps use that short recoil locking system. It uses a tilting barrel, you know, as part of the action on the locking cycle, like a Glock, for example, while the M&P 5.7 uses a rotating barrel inside of a sleeve with a gas system. This sleeve is a fixed sleeve. You have a rotating barrel inside of this fixed sleeve that has gas ports in it that work in conjunction with the outer sleeve to kind of delay the unlocking of the rotating action. Smith & Wesson calls this the tempo gas system. The benefit of the design, you can use a fixed suppressor without a Nielsen or booster device because the barrel's fixed. It's not going anywhere. The additional weight of the suppressor won't hinder the movement of the barrel or the cycling of the action. Additionally, many 22 lr suppressors will work fine with 5.7, so if you have a half by 28 threaded suppressor, you can probably thread it on this pistol like I did. While some people might scoff at using a 5.7 pistol firing a supersonic round as a suppressor host, I've shown on my personal channel and in other videos, subsonic 5.7 exists, and it sounds good, and it'll even puncture soft body armor. Another difference between the M&P 5.7 and other M&Ps is the fact that the M&P 5.7 doesn't use a striker, rather it uses an internal hammer, meaning that it's kind of a f***ed up single action only pistol, a little bit like your grandpa's 1911, except instead of blood, sweat, and tears, the M&P 57 is more anime, white claw, and social anxiety. But it also means that you get a pretty excellent single action trigger, and I would go so far to say that the M&P 5.7 has the best trigger of the non-performance center M&P pistols. It's that good, dead serious. 
As with most 5.7 pistols, it's like they forgot to install the recoil feature in this gun. Shell casings get absolutely bounced out of this gun like they just touched a dancer, but the ejection pattern is consistent and shooting one is certainly more painful to your wallet than it is your hand. I'm hoping that 5.7 prices continue to go down because this is one incredibly fun gun to shoot. Ah! Five, six, seven. Fuck. That one ruined it. One, two, three, four, five, six. It comes cut for shield RMSC pattern micro red dot optic, which really is a key for 5.7. The claim to fame of this round is, again, the ability to puncture Chrysat armor at over 100 yards. But hitting a torso-sized target at that distance with standard iron sights is only a little bit easier than getting my wife to pick a place for dinner, no matter how flat shooting your pistol is. If you want to capitalize on the increased range, picking up a red dot, critical. I'd recommend the 407 or 507 from Holosun for the M&P. We shot several different types of ammo at the range, but we blew through five or six boxes of miscellaneous 5.7 in no time. The least expensive stuff I could find was Federal American Eagle. I've actually read some complaints about Federal American Eagle, their 5.7 rounds, but I probably have shot a case of it over the past year. I've never had an issue with it in carbines or pistols. Of course, we also shot FN SS197SR, the sporting round. We shot SS198, which is an armor-piercing hollow point. We shot gold dot defensive 5.7 hollow points, and even SS190, the Mac Daddy of armor-piercing 5.7 rounds, capable of punching through some level three armors. We had no failures whatsoever, suppressed or unsuppressed. By the way, we tested three different types of ammo on an Italian Kevlar SEP2 helmet. I'd include that in this video, but the video is already running kind of long as is, and I don't want TFB TV to get in trouble for racy gun content like testing armor piercing rounds, so check my personal channel for that video. Shooting my 22 suppressor on this gun, of course, fun as hell. but it also seems to generate enough back pressure that I could feel some debris in my face. As long as you're wearing eye protection, it's still less annoying than watching your sister's kids. And I wonder aloud if you used a suppressor with a larger internal diameter, if you'd get less blowback. I would think so. Ergonomics, substantially similar to the M&P series, and that's to say they're good. An ambi slide release, a reversible mag release, Good grip texture, the M&P style grip that you're used to while we're talking about the grip. This gun is only 1.1 inches thick, meaning it's pretty much the identical grip to the already slim Smith & Wesson Shield Plus. Some people might laugh at the idea of carrying a 5.7 pistol concealed, but that is utterly plausible with this Smith & Wesson. In fact, perhaps one of the only negatives that I have for this pistol at the moment is that it's exclusively available in this threaded barrel model. I'd like to see a non-threaded barrel model that would be a little bit easier to carry because you absolutely could if you had a good holster. At just over 26 ounces, it's only 7 tenths of an ounce heavier than a Glock 17. Indeed, the dimensions are very close to the, oh, that's a Glock 19, to the Glock 17, which I have somewhere around here. Yep, and here is my studio Glock 17. Everybody has a studio Glock 17, bathroom Glock 17, kitchen Glock 17. The difference, you can see here, the barrel is a little bit longer with the 5.7, but the 5.7 is two tenths of an inch thinner than the Glock 17. Everywhere else, the dimensions, like the height, pretty much identical. I mean, for all intents and purposes, this has a very similar footprint and weight to the Glock 17. So I guess if you're looking for a frame of reference, this gun is basically a thin Glock 17. Now, how does the Smith stack up to the FN 5.7 pistol? I've got the 5.7 Mark III. I absolutely love it. Because the FN's almost exclusively polymer, including the slide, this gun weighs three ounces less than this gun. But it's also about an inch shorter in length because the Smith & Wesson has that extended threaded barrel. Otherwise, they're very similar. That said, the FN's actually a little bit taller and about two tenths of an inch thicker than the M&P. Also, you're getting a whopping 22 rounds in a Smith & Wesson magazine versus 20 
in the FN. Again, I really hope Smith reconsiders releasing this in a non-threaded barrel version because you really could slide this thing in your pants if you wanted to bet your life on this wild ass cartridge. Obviously, you guys are here at TFB TV because you want me to make a general comparative statement about whether or not to get the Smith & Wesson M&P 57 versus your other options out there. Let's get two of them out of the way right now. One, while I think Ruger might be one of the most underrated manufacturers out there, huge Ruger guy right here, street price on the Ruger 5.7 is more than the Smith & Wesson. The Ruger 5.7 is a perfectly fine pistol. I've used it before, shot it suppressed, hop reviewed it, got hundreds of thousands of views. Great option. But the Smith & Wesson version is somehow undercutting Ruger on pricing and offering more features. So Smith & Wesson handily beats the Ruger in my estimation as we sit here today. If Ruger decides to price under Smith, then game on, I guess. Next, let's talk about the PSA Rock. I bought a complete PSA Rock with one magazine for, I think, under $350 during Black Friday. That review's coming, but if you want to see why I hate dealing with budget companies, my PSA Rock looks like it's missing two roll pins in the frame for the fire control group. Get a load of this horse shit. I called Palmetto State Armory's customer service for replacement roll pins, which showed up about a week later, and they sent me the wrong parts. F*** this shit. I don't care if it's $300 cheaper, wouldn't buy it. That leaves us with the Smith & Wesson and the FN 5.7. These are the only two 5.7 pistols I own, so this falls under the buy both category for me. If you want to save some money, the Smith & Wesson is extremely promising for its incredibly low price, and I bet moving forward, Smith is probably going to outsell the FN. I mean, it's, it's half as much, right? Greater capacity, thinner, half price, you can get a Smith in a case of 5.7 ammo for the price of one FN. Side note real quick for bearing with me this long. I was dictating my video outline for this review and my phone picked up how to take your butt, I wipe my ass and just as much. What my phone was supposed to hear was hot take, but I like my FN just as much. It's lighter and even though it's much more expensive with no threaded barrel and it's thicker with two fewer rounds of capacity, the fact remains that first of all, it's a damn fine gun to shoot. And second, it's a gun that's been around for almost three decades, been adopted by a bunch of government agencies. If that means something to you, it means something to me, I like having a long track record of performance, then you shouldn't rule out the FN, especially the Mark III version, which is incredible. But as I said at the beginning of this video, if you send an M&P 5.7 spit sample to 23andMe, it's gonna come back as being mostly from the proven M&P family with What's that, 5.7% Yayoi people's DNA? Oh yeah, I guess the whole anime thing, it makes sense. If you're thinking about getting into 5.7, the Smith & Wesson, probably your best buy right now. My only apprehension is that it's brand spanking new. It's only like three weeks old as I record this video. If Smith & Wesson wants to send me a case of 5.7, I'll run a thousand rounds through this son of a bitch and I'll tell you how it's holding up after that. But in the meantime, you're gonna have to get the long-term range review from Warren Buffett, but for $650, my short experience on the range so far says that the Smith & Wesson can't miss, so I'd give it a shot if you're thinking about dipping your toe into the 5.7 pool. And if you're gonna do that, you need to get your ammo from Ventura Munitions, cheapest ammo that you can get for the FN 5.7, and if you like Smith & Wesson, Make sure you buy it from Top Gun Supply, your online shooting sports superstore. They donate four guns a month that we give away to Utreon and subscribe star supporters. So make sure you go over there and subscribe, support TFB TV. We don't take money in exchange for positive reviews. We just do it for you, babe. Thanks for watching. Take care.